personal reasons. Uh, but I wanted to just write this tribute to the idea that sometimes people just show up in your life and help you when you least expected it. And so that was the impetus for Ricky getting a invitation in the mail at a bus station toilet. But for some reason it was, I don't know, it just it came across very strongly that um, the faith you're taught as a child has such a large impact on your faith as an adult, and I guess I was wondering what your personal background was there. Uh, so my mom's side of the family is the side of my mom and dad got married and divorced by the time I was at night or one. Um, and so I was raised by my mom's side of the family. My mom's side of the family is from Uganda, East Africa. Uh, so they were Episcopalians, but it's uh, African Episcopalian, which the joke we had was that's like double Catholic. <laughs> um, especially if you keep off non -using. Now, uh, if there's anybody pushing still for like the hardcore, uh, cons uh, how can I put it? Really hardcore Episcopalian sort of wing of the faith, it's more coming from um, certain parts of the U.S., but also particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. So I was raised by my grandmother, who was this kind of Episcopalian. Um, and so that played a huge part in the house. The only two books that we had in the house, I mean, generally speaking, were the Bible and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and uh, so I had no interest in reading the Bible. And I only read Encyclopedia Britannica to write book reports. Uh, and I'd also like to say, you know, people nowadays get mad at kids in high school or college for stealing from Wikipedia, like, wholesale. But I just stole from Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, when I was a kid. But I guess it was fact-checked. So that's the only difference. Uh, so, but, so that was part of my background. And I had this grandmother who believed deeply who we would pray at various, uh, you know, big things like Christmas, non-Christian things like Thanksgiving, uh, were somehow now important Christian holidays in the house, uh, as was, frankly, like, uh, you know, when family visited. Uh, so that, that was a big part of me, but what also was there was that my mom was a believer, but she thought, you don't have to go to church after 18. Uh, like, you've done your time, and you, you're, you're free. Right. Uh, so as a result, when I was a kid, my grandmother was too sick and old to go to church, and my mom had no interest in going. So they used to just put me in a cab uh, with 10, 10 bucks to go to church every Sunday. I had on my little scoop and all this. And so five bucks was for the cab, there and back, and five dollars was for the offer. But once I was in the cab, I would, most of the time, 60% of the time, tell the cab driver, let's go to the arcade. <laughs> Drop me off, we won't tell anybody about this. <laughs> and then I would run through 715 quarters, and then walk home, and say, yeah, school was great, church was great. Uh, can't wait to go back. <laughs> a love story I hoped. There was a uh, sort of thriller novel in there. Uh, and I hoped also a novel just about places that haven't been about, like sort of more of a travelogue about, you know, bathrooms, <laughs> Oakland, Vermont, upstate New York, and Queens. Um, and so basically it was almost like each draft of the book was me writing a different version of the novel. So there was one version that was literally just all the places. And uh, what really aggravated my editor was that I was in trying to learn how to write about these places and how to get the characters through them. I was literally writing, so then he would walk to the corner of North First Street, and then he made a right, and he walked for four blocks, 
And at the fifth block, he made a left. And the editor's note was just like, you have to be joking. <laughs> and uh, so that draft, after we're done with that, is his editing job and essentially was, we're cutting out this 300 pages of left and right turns. <laughs> and so then the next draft was the religious novel, you know? And so I'm writing it and I'm writing just mostly about the washerwomen in the past and some degree of Solomon Clay in the present and all these aspects of faith. And my editor, I was very lucky because he'd also been raised in a very specific religious background. He was uh, from a family of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so the great thing was we were able, he was able to say, here's the things that were very important to me and here's the things that were very harmful to me and here's just even the books we would read and so forth like that. And so then the next couple drafts of the book were just trying to make these aspects of faith sort of play together. One would hopefully speak to the other and to make each one believable, you know, and one of the things I'm like proudest of, if I can pat myself on the back, huh? um, <laughs> is uh, that the washerwomen's faith is entirely made up, but it's the thing that people have believed the most, you know, and uh, on one level I know this because they don't at some point turn into monsters, which helps. Uh, but it's, I, I think it's also that the, their aspects, their beliefs, the ways that they proselytize, so forth like that, seem maybe uh, vivid enough that people, or at least some people, could believe in a religion like this. Uh, so that was, I went through that uh, throughout the book for all those various kinds of narratives. Uh, you know, in the end, there's no such thing as a perfect book, so some things maybe work more than others, particularly to different people. Can you uh, speak to what it is that actually saves her when, yeah, um, when she's like, I should have died, I should have burned up there, but it seems like either a guardian angel, because the, um, the angels then do get affected by um, you know, the fire at that point, and they are actually hurt, but yet Adele escapes unscathed. And, and can you speak to what exactly that was, maybe? Yes, although I'm gonna just do something real fast, because I have to, since I have the phone in one hand, I gotta take the top off this now, but I don't wanna seem like a complete drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you'll be able to see the YouTube clip. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to explain myself a little bit. I gotta say, in the history of authors who have drank with us, you've taken it to a new level. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming down to ours. Uh, that was my pal. All right, you have access now? Easy access? <laughs> yes, I have it back. Right. <laughs> so, uh, in that moment, I thought of it as uh, the voice is protecting her. One of the sort of ironies that I really wanted to have in the novel was that Adele is... Like some people, sometimes people have thought what I'm saying in here that either people who have faith are good and people who don't are bad, or people who have faith are bad and people who don't are good. But I hoped it was more complicated than that. And so in Adele, I saw her as my representative of people who are completely agnostic at the very least, who have no interest in having faith, in, in thinking about faith. They just are... Uh, they're concerned with this world, and they want to make this world better in the best sense, or sometimes they just care about themselves in the more selfish sense. But that she is a complete pragmatist. She's not interested in the faith stuff. But that even within that, the voice does not, the voice takes this moment to say, but you are valuable to this larger mission, idea, or plan. So I'm going to do you a solid and not let you burn up. Uh, because I know you're important, even if you don't think I'm important. So, yeah, that's it.